Welcome everybody, this is The Art of the Streaming Mix. This is gonna be one of those times where we can all kind of uh, share some ideas on how we get things done. So on the panel today, uh, Gilly, who uh, is working on his internet connection to get in. So Gilly worked at uh, Willow Creek for a while, and then he followed one of the pastors when he came to California and worked at Eastside Christian Church, and he's been an advisor to churches all over the place. Um, one of the things that's interesting is, is, you know, sometimes you come up with a system and you say, you know, I've mastered this idea, and, and Gilly is not one of those guys. He's always rethinking it and saying, you know, how can I make this even better? You know, what technology can I use? Can I automate? Is it better to have something automated, or is it better to have somebody on the, the system? So uh, he'll be joining us. Uh, Doug Gold, you might know him as Worship MD. So I don't know, Doug, you want to just uh, tell people a little bit about yourself, or yeah, everything I learned about <laughs> sound, I learned <laughs> everything I learned about sound, I learned in my bar band, and then I got <laughs> and then I got saved and uh, started working in churches more or less. But um, I never really had a job that focused on the church until I started working for sure. All the jobs I held prior to that. Music store, JBL rep in New England, Emus uh, regional manager, Tascam regional manager. It was all sales oriented. And then sure, let me just talk to end users. So I developed training programs for volunteers and churches. My heart is for small churches, less than, you know, 800,000 people where they're staffed yeah. by volunteers and they, they do other things for a living. They don't do sound for a living. They're a plumber, they're a cop, they're a soccer mom. And uh, I'm just trying to give them a leg up on how to do things a little bit better in terms of mixing, microphone techniques, in-ear monitoring, recording, basics, fundamental stuff. Chris Gilley is from the other end of the extreme. He's an engineer. I'm primarily a musician who knows how to talk to people who don't know anything. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Worship MD came about uh, after Sure Let Me Go. Uh, I was market development manager for sure. And for seven years, they let me just run around the church. And uh, I built up a whole network of people and friends in that community. So when I was let go, it was the impetus to start a freelance market development company. Uh, but instead of being exclusive for one manufacturer, I had various clients who shared the resources, who shared the expenses. So I've had PreSonus, Audio-Technica, Korg, Westone, Ultimate Ears, so many. Right now, my current clients include Yamaha, <laughs> Martin Guitars. I've heard of them. And uh, Earthworks. <laughs> so I, I teach at about 30 events a year still, but with this pandemic, all my events probably through July have been canceled. So we're doing more of this kind of thing now. I've been on three podcasts in the last week, and uh, a lot of people are now digging deeper into things that they might not have had time to solve before. And now they're, they're reading, they're, they're looking for answers. And maybe by the time this thing is over, they'll have some clear cut ideas of how to proceed with some things they've always wanted to do before this happened. So yeah, anyway, that's it. And actually when we were having a conversation preparing for this, uh, Gilly, uh, Doug and I were all sitting there and we were just like, yeah, you know, sometimes you get a stream and then you get pulled because of uh, you don't have the rights for it, or people think you don't have the rights for it, or something like that. And we all kind of looked at each other and said, I really can't talk about that. I don't know enough about that. And uh, Doug's like, I know just the guy. And uh, so Paul came in, literally, uh, I just talked to him yesterday and said, hey, would you like to join this? And he, and he was good enough to come. Do you want to tell people uh, sort of your experience with, with um, licensing and a little bit about what you're doing now? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Uh, I am one of those guys that uh, got to become friends with and, and network with Doug along the way. Um, currently, I am the um, marketing director for a worship community called People and Songs. Um, we were founded by Jenny Lee Riddle, who wrote the um, worship song, Revelation Song. Um, but previous to that, uh, I was on staff at CCLI for 17 years. CCLI... Yeah. And copyright Licensing International. It's the group that really helps churches be legal in all of the activities that they have related to worship music and worship 
uh, cop, um, copying activities for worship songs. Uh, CCLI itself uh, began in the late 80s. So I think it's, yeah, just over 30 years now running. Um, there are over 160,000 churches in North America and Canada that have our basic license, uh, over 250,000 worldwide. Um, so that's the history, that's the legacy of it. Uh, at about, in 2011 it was, I helped to launch the CCLI streaming license. Uh, and obviously that's what I bring to the conversation today. So glad to be here, glad to be with you guys. Right on. Well, thanks for joining us, especially on the short notice. Uh, he has no idea what questions we're going to pose to him. He's totally flying blind. It's, uh, that's <laughs> brave. <laughs> when, when I did that, um, that trade show where we were talking about the streaming mix, it was interesting because certain churches were sharing, you know, how big their, their streaming audience was. And this was three years ago. But the biggest number that the churches were talking about was like, eh, maybe 20. Some of the churches were saying, you know, it is a small market, so we don't really want to put a whole lot of money into it because there's only so many people there. But some of the churches said something interesting. They said, you know, we're actually not trying to let people stay at home. We're trying to get them into the church. They, they said they felt that was a stronger experience, right? You get the personal connection and things like that, and it's more immersive. It's more, you're, you're really there, right? There's less distractions. Um, Anyway, so, and now it's flipped. I mean, obviously right now, probably there is no in-person event. But I think that even once we start, uh, I'm, I'm not going to play doctor. I don't know when the virus is going to end and what the, you know, we, ha we have this phased thing as we start coming back in. But um, I think it is clear that once we get the all clear to start having services again, which for some people may be a month away, uh, other people it'll be longer depending on where you're at. Um, once we do that, there will still be the vulnerable population who would be ill-advised to be gathering, right? They are people that should be isolating because they are more susceptible, uh, more at risk of the virus thing. So I think the stream is going to be an important tool for us until we get a vaccine or something like that. And that's probably looking into early next year. So um, even though we're going to think we're getting back to normal operation, I don't think that's going to be entirely the case. We're going to rely on this, uh, this dream to keep people engaged for some time. Yeah. Anyway, so when I first approached this with, uh, with Gilly, I tuned into a couple of different churches and see what their streaming mix was like. And I knew, it, you know, we're always working on a budget. So I get that. But sometimes what I would do is I would listen to it and I would say, you know what, there are things you can do affordably and maybe you even already have some of the things to make your mix come out better. Um, one of the most common things I would see is people would take their mix from the front of house console and they would just say, let's just take that because that's, you know, the whole room sounds great. Let's just feed that to the stream and that's going to be fantastic. A couple of problems with that. Um, my brain works like math. Whatever your stage volume is, you have a monitor person that's saying, I'm going to create the complement to that stage noise so that the musicians hear what they want. So in the monitors, there's not usually a whole lot of drums because there's plenty of that on the stage. But so your, your monitor mix, uh, it's usually really low on drums and really, really hot on vocals, right? And then you're making different mixes for people that are inverted. Now, as we go to in-ear monitors, people don't necessarily think about this so much because it's a personal mix that everybody's creating. But once you get to the live PA, you still have to deal with that. So as the live engineer, as the front of house engineer now, um, you've probably got a situation where the drums are too loud and the, you know, certain things can't even be heard from a distance. So the mix that you're creating is not balanced on its own. It's balanced with the noise of the room. And this is a huge concept. So, if you take that board mix, the drums are too low, the vocals are too far out front. And the other thing is, it's usually way too dry um, because you have the sound of the room already in the room, right? Um, another thing that's different, <laughs> most people don't mic the audience, right? You're not, you're not amplifying that. But once the person that's watching the stream, they don't hear any of this stuff. 
they literally just hear what you give them. And so the front of house mix, like I said, it's usually shy on certain instruments that are naturally allowed in the room. Um, and, you know, it's the other instruments are out of perspective. And then you don't have the room at all. And you certainly don't have the congregation. Now, capturing the room is another element and capturing the audience is another element. Um, one of the things that I ran across um, when I did something for, I was at the National Association of Broadcasters. I had to put together a, a sound system for one of their stages where they were going to do presentations at this trade show and they wanted to stream it all. So I said, okay, well, if it's just the presentation in the hall, that's one set of systems. And then I put up some microphones for the audience. I mean, there's probably only 20 seats. But I just said, you know, you've got to have that. And they said, well, why? I said, well, suppose somebody up on the stage tells a joke. They're, they're waiting to say anything more because they're waiting for the audience to finish laughing. Or, you know, the pastor is going to do a call and response. You want to be able to hear the pastor say something and you want to hear the other people respond. So there's, there's all sorts of things like that that you want to make sure that you're capturing as naturally as possible. And then as you capture the audience, um, you are going to begin to capture the room, the ambient sound of the room as well. It's going to be hard to get the audience without that. But Doug, I think that's, that's a place where we were going to come to you, uh, especially since you have so much experience with microphone companies. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the, like the types of microphones you might use to mic an audience and where people typically put them? And I think you'd mentioned uh, you know, the high and the low microphone points and things like that. Um, sure. yeah. Some people are trying to repurpose mics they already have so they don't have to go out and spend more. So let's say your church has emerged from wedges to in-ear. I never start anybody on in-ears unless I have some ambient mics to begin with. One of the big advantages yeah. of, of in-ears is be able to isolate, but that's also their weakness. <laughs> <laughs> isolated, now I can't hear anything. Unless it's, if they're seated properly, if they're fitted correctly, that's what you yeah. really want. You want to protect the ears from all the ambient noise and you want to hear the things that you want to hear. But on the other hand, if you're a worship leader and you want to hear your congregation singing, I surrender, <laughs> and you can't hear them singing anything, that's a problem. I had that yeah. problem with Chris Tomlin for years. He kept pulling an ear out because he couldn't hear the congregation singing until we set up some ambient microphones on the stage that were aimed at the congregation. And then what he could do is dial in how much he wanted. And there's some tricks to that, right? You wanna have the microphones yeah. oriented properly so the left side comes in your left ear. Because if a guy stands up on the right and yells hallelujah, you don't want it to come out your left ear, right? So you far so good. Image. I mean, one mic will do if you're doing mono mixes, I guess that works, but stereo is best. Stereo is also best for your mix coming in. Now, if I have those set up for my, my musicians already, I can repurpose those as a starting point for my audience mics on my stream. Now, what kind of mics do you use? I guess you could use an SM57, but it's not, not the right type of mic. You wanna get something with a little bit more sensitivity, maybe with a little bit higher frequency response, the low end you're gonna knock off anyway. You're going to roll off the low end, I don't know, 350, 400, 500, high pass it, <laughs> get rid of all that audience rumble. I don't want, I want the shimmer of the crowd, not the, not the mumble, not the rumble. The best mics to use are condensers, mm -hmm. but they should also have a certain kind of pattern. The best ones I've used for audience micing are shotgun mics. Because what you can do is you get distant, but you don't get the close... Um, off axis proximity stuff happening. Um, you can use omnis, like if you're on a ceiling, aim down, omnis can work. Unless you're in a small club with a low ceiling, then that doesn't work so well. <laughs> so again, the room is going to be dependent on where you put them. A really nice application and a solution for audience miking is uh, PZM mics or boundary mics. You can stick those right on a wall. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they work pretty nicely. If you have more than two, you can put them in various places to get different types of elements. So when you're mixing the audience mics, it doesn't sound like just two mics aimed at a spot. You're getting like a variety of different coverages. 
don't use your choir mics for room mics. <laughs> don't use them for your ambient mics for your musicians either. Um, that's where the problem comes in with using ambient mics for, for purposing for streaming, because I want to adjust those microphones for the musicians ears and sometimes some compromises have to be made. So you might want to yeah. add another pair above that or somewhere else in the room. I found the, the worst things to do are aim them right at the PA. <laughs> Actually, now you because have to deal with delay and some other things. And so many digital mixers now have the ability to do input delay and output delay, but you want to make sure that those yeah. things are kind of timed correctly. Omnis can work, but you gotta, you gotta be careful where you put them. If you put the Omnis closer to the stage, you'll get more of the stage. If you put them back more in the far field, in the diffused field, then it kind of doesn't make any much difference. Uh, and if you increase the high frequencies on them, then we'll get a little bit more intelligibility to them. Depends what you want the audience mics to do. Do you want it to sound like it's just this big reverberant field? Or do you want it to sound like it's isolated on things more for, for uh, intelligibility? Yeah. So anyway, those are some things. And I can send you a list of resources and links to help people understand types, operating principles, patterns, where they should put them to start with. There's some good articles online about that stuff. So, Yeah, and actually, when we first started having this conversation, Doug, you were bringing it up like, well, what type of mic you'd use and where you'd put it also depends on the room, right? Because if, if you're in, I think you were saying, if you're in a black box with a low ceiling, that's right. totally different than if you're in a, you know, right. more of a traditional hall with, you know, high ceilings and catwalks and all this kind of stuff. Exactly right. Um, I'd say, Chris, you had some ideas on that as well. One of the things I thought you brought up really well was, you know, the Omni is great if you're trying to capture the room. If you're trying to capture the audience, right, go with cardioid or something that's directional towards the audience. And you're also talking about different heights of, of microphones for different purposes. Yes, uh, I do. Um, I do like to tailor those kinds of approaches to what the mics are that we're dealing with. So hopefully we can consider all those factors before we choose the mic in the first place. But then, okay, here's the mic that we're working with. The mic decides some things about where it has to go at that point. Um, I'd say picking up a, a group of an audience, I would hope that the pattern is at least picking up 50 people. It's going to be obviously if you pick up 10 and it's it's really nice if you're picking up hundreds, but whatever the pattern of that mic is to pick up at least 50 to 100 people. So um, whatever that pattern is and that geometry to the number of seats can help determine the height of it. Um, the farther away the mic is, the less signal coming from them and the more PA coming into the backside. So then the rejection pattern is the other half. So the attention of how far away to get more people without getting into the PA more than the audience and then trying to get a nice group of people that's representative, usually like a third of the way back or more. Um, yeah. So you're not picking up individuals or, or um, discrete sounds or miking the aisle more than people. And then the reflections from the PA. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people over mic things, especially yeah. like the choirs and stuff. You'll see a 12 voice choir with eight SM58s on them. It's like, <laughs> yeah. it's at a distance, yeah. okay? Yeah. Yeah. Whenever you're distant miking, especially, that three to one rule comes in big time because otherwise you're going to get all these cross sections and spotlighting and weird frequency pickups because you got multiple mics picking up similar sources at different times. And that all gets out of phase. So yeah. here's one thing you should always learn about microphones. Start with the fewest number and add them if you need them. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. More mics usually sounds worse than a lot of mics. I mean, uh, then fewer mics, I mean, so. Yeah, I remember, um, so I did some, when I, when I first graduated high school, I went back and I helped, you know, uh, the choir and the drama department and the band and, and dance team and all this stuff. I mean, I helped them put together the sound systems. And since this was the early 90s, I was, I thought I was really cool. I had a DAT player. And uh, I brought that to one of the events one time, and I just used the aug sends to create another mix, right? Uh, I just took a post fader send, put everything at nominal, but then I cranked the piano into it because the piano was already plenty allowed in the venue. I didn't have to put it through the PA. So I just blended that in. And then I added two microphones on the audience. That was the only thing new that I'd put up there. I, and to your point, I put 
whatever PZM microphones I had. But I thought just as an experiment, let's see what it sounds like. And it came out surprisingly well. A few microphones goes a long way. Mm -hmm. uh, so Gilly, do you want to talk a bit, little bit about how the structure looks when you're blending these things together? And a couple of things. I know that was one of the, one of the topics for you. The other one was uh, you had a lot of good information about target levels. Well, uh, if you haven't mentioned it, I hope you do talk more about it. I love the way that you talk about most of the mixing we do, especially for the different zones, broadcast in the room, monitors, ears, is uh, oh. noise augmentation, <laughs> noise yes. enhancement. <laughs> so, well, to build on that, the, the ambience includes the PA. Um, the PA includes uh, stage noise from mic bleed, including some of the PA back into itself. Uh, so all these things are blends to begin with, and we need to get on top of that to be able to have control of those blends and balances. Um, but one that happens that's a, a dramatic gap to me, maybe one of the most dramatic ones, I think, is um, the difference between music and speech level when you're live in the room. Um, it's reasonable and realistic to have that variation in peaks and in averages um, to be in the 15 dB neighborhood, sometimes 20 if you don't get a lot of gain before uh, feedback or you're fighting those kinds of things. And sitting there live in the room with all of the um, visual connection, the emotional connection, um, our brains help us supplement. We can overcome acoustic challenges and uh, we can tolerate and even thrive in that kind of a dynamic range or the dynamic difference between music and speech. As soon as we're outside of the room and outside of some of those cues, it's much more challenging to um, understand the, that difference. Um, and then you add that to the typical higher noise floors that are outside of the live spaces that are designed to support communication. Driving in the car with the window down, uh, there's somebody sawing wood next to my little studio here right now. Um, all those things close in and um, we find ourselves reaching for the volume unless we bring those things much closer together. And in today's more aggressive, aggressively processed dynamic ranges, the difference between loud music and loud speech is 6 dB and closing tighter. So the difference between 15 to 20 and everything outside of the room being three or six, um, I'd say that's one of the first things I go for is when you were talking about uh, building your broadcast mix or an aux bus or piping more piano into it is uh, to take speech and treat it a little differently than loud music and crank it up to close that window so everything that's processing downstream of that has much less work to do and things sound more open to begin with. The other thing that you'd mentioned too, and this gets back to audience mics, and I think we'll have probably covered that pretty well, but you'd mentioned you've got like mics that are lower and then mics that are higher and sometimes you're actually combining them. You know, I don't think I'd ever thought about having multiple heights of microphones. I was like, I'm just gonna find the perfect place for this one microphone, I'm gonna fight for that. But realistically, sometimes you can't. You know, or to your point, you're, you're trying to bring in different elements and so it is appropriate to get two different sounds and combine it rather than try to find some spot that may not even exist. So getting into, uh a couple of different zones of ambi mics. It's, uh, I like how it um, re-blends and re-smears the timing arrival of things. Um, so when we're listening to our room, we're hearing thousands or millions of reflections, some of them reverberant, some of them direct. Um, and then um, we also are hearing it from two sources and we're combining our ears and combining that. So uh, I do like the idea of having some close so you can, I guess, in a way, localize to what's happening right in front of you, particularly those that are lit up more from stage backlight spill. So you're visually connecting to the people in front of you and you're audibly connected in your ears through the, through the stage mics to those in front of you. Um, and on those, I personally like to fly those at least at ear height, which Doug, I like your point there for relative orientation but also to get them out of tamper proof or somebody can walk right up to it and you're hearing a conversation very clearly. So on the high side there on those, but then adding some overheads that can shoot deeper in the room to get uh, a larger group of people, a more choral effect. It's, and then at that point, it's picking up more of the room's 
reverb. That is in the reverberant field where the close ones are probably going to be in the direct reflection. Direct reflection, and so you can get a, a sense of more people and a broader sense of the, what the whole room's returning in the background of four or more mics in different locations like that. Yeah. So I see one question. I'll see if I can answer it. Maybe you guys will have more comments. Um, won't you get phasing issues by setting up mics from a single source at various heights or various distances? Yeah, you will. If, it's, if they're set up um, at the same source and they're too close together, Yes, yes, but that's why we have a thing called the three to one rules. Yeah. It's like a choir. If I've got a microphone that's three feet in front of a soloist, I don't want another microphone five feet in front of that soloist. It's too close because the speed of sound is about roughly a thousand feet per second. It's going to hit the mic at three milliseconds and the other one at five. So when it gets to the mixer, they sum and now there's comb filtering out of phase. So different yeah. heights aimed at different places. When Chris said, I think, was he's aiming it at a different source. He's not aiming it at the same place that the other mics are aimed at. Right. So that's, that's one right. difference there. And then the other difference is how far away is it from the other one height-wise or distant-wise. So Yeah, so I'll say that if we have a close mic and a distant mic, we have a difference in volume. Right. We're also dealing with a lot more reflections on the distant mic. And to Chris's point, he actually likes the smear of all of these things. And that's what you're blending in. You're bringing in that room sound. Yeah. And depending um, on the pattern that you're using too, I could maybe use a cardioid for the close pickup, like for the yeah. musician's ears and use a shotgun on top. <laughs> yeah. And th those polar patterns are completely different. So it's going to reject a lot of the off axis stuff that the, uh, that the cardioid might be picking up. That's a great combination. And then that uh, shotgun up top is going to try to ignore the PA being up near the roar of all that. Right. That's a good point. So actually, there was one question. Uh, so what is your approach to time aligning mics? First of all, you know, not everybody has gear that will be able to do that. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, if, if you've ever worked with a reverb processor, there's usually early reflections, you know, when's the rest of the reverb tail coming in, there's phases of this stuff coming together. And so what you're probably really pulling together is something that should be delayed slightly anyway, because it is further away, but I don't know if, if I guess if the room gets big enough, you know, if I'm, uh, if my only ambient mic is a hundred feet back, that might be a little too long. I might try to pull it back up a little bit. Exactly. Good point. Um, I'm sure there's a lot I have to learn here. I look forward to, to learning more here. Uh, the only time, the only times those have come to mind or one you just said is when the mic's too far away. So it's picking up a great amount of audience but it's so far from the PA that the, the PA that does leak in there is just so late. It's, it's yeah. disconnected. It's non-coherent anymore. It's distracting. Uh, so that would be a physical time alignment of moving the mic closer to the PA to get it back into the window of reality. Um, and then the second one would be the low mics on the stage that are close miking, closer miking the front row, basically. If those mics are closer to the front row, than the person on stage is from the front row, which happens often as the proscenium comes around and the seating curves around. If those front low mics are closer to people than the person with the ears is, then to push those, mic, push those mics back in time to at least not get, not get to him before an actual human standing there would. <laughs> like yeah. at least push it back to the speed of sound. So, um, so it's not hitting him before his own snare drum or something. I mean, that, that can get really literal and maybe a little competitive and a little distracting. So those are the two that, that come to mind for timing. One physical and one electronic. I agree. That's why they've even started putting delay on headphone outputs on consoles. Because you're like 100 feet back. <laughs> the guy puts his headphones on, he's hearing it instantly. And then about 90, 100 milliseconds later, he's hearing the PA. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. To your other point, though, Pat, it's an artistic decision, I think. Yeah. Well, it's artistic. Sometimes and that, what sometimes equipment that do you delay have? adds to the effect of how big the audience in room are, just like early reflections on a reverb. Yeah. That's what's going to give you the indications of the size of the space. Yeah. This again, I'd love to invite a guest named Eddie Kramer, who's a friend of mine, who did the Woodstock album, <laughs> Frampton yeah. Comes Alive. Song remains the same, and, 
he recorded Woodstock at that field in New York State with a four track with the stage mics. I don't think there was any audience mics. How do you get that huge crowd sound? I'd like to ask him that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I see one of the questions, which is, do you have meter targets? Uh, personally, lately, um, if you have uh, processing helping you to achieve these targets, these are, these are aggressive targets to hit without processing to help. Uh, but if you have processing in place, uh, multiband compression or limiting, um, or compressors or limiters or multiband EQ, um, then loud music, process, uh, compressed loud music peaks at uh, minus three on a zero dBFS meter. And that would be right there with the movie trailers, with the um, sports broadcasts, with the news broadcasts. So the loudest of things is that minus three gives you just enough headroom for digital clipping. And usually anybody that's over minus three and it is tapping zero is very controlled with it or very um, uh, intentional with it. Or they're the infomer infomercial class where you're going through YouTube and you just hear the one blaring on top and it's just distorted for the sake of getting attention. So um, the loudest things at minus three, um, the peaks of uh, energetic speech at minus six or, or the peaks of speech between minus six and minus 10. And those were, uh, those were if you're just scrolling through um, the broadcast channels or um, large scale streaming channels, they'll be right there in the same pocket. Yeah. Hey Patrick, I'm gonna put up a meter just for a second here since yeah. somebody asked about levels. <laughs> My peaks that are, are at uh, minus 10 on the low side, which is tech check right there. I'm hitting a, a minus 10 and that would be on the low side. Um, uh, for for broadcast level because when we hit slam in music or a compressed play out or something at minus three um, from where we're talking right now that would just assault you I just wanted to put that up for a moment uh, this is a great uh, meter for OSX it's five bucks and it's really accurate and then you can uh, pick up um, sound grid or the local OS or any of those things and see what the average and peak is um, and I've compared it to very expensive meters, so it's pretty handy to have available just to just to check stuff. So the other thing that was interesting, and there was a guy that says, you know, when I do the broadcast mix, I just get a split of everything. We just take it right off the network, and I, I feed it into my console, and I do everything in an isolated room. So he had it right that it, it's very difficult to do your broadcast mix in the sanctuary, right? You really kind of need to be in an isolated room so you get away from all that noise, and you're evaluating something as people would normally hear it. So maybe you'll listen to it through studio monitors. Maybe it's good to have, you know, a pair of just earbuds so you can hear what that would sound like. You know, maybe you have an iPad or, an, or a phone or something like that where you're tuning in. You can see what it sounds like on that, um, especially when you're first putting things together to kind of see how your mix translates to different speaker systems. But you'd mentioned once you put somebody in an isolated room like that, as a technician, they no longer have the visual cues on when to pull people in and out of mute. Uh, you know, basically what you'd notice, the broadcast mixer would often unmute somebody too late or too early. So somebody's, you know, preparing to go on stage. And as soon as they think they're out of view, they're having a conversation with people about whatever. So um, I thought it was interesting because you, you were mentioning at the time, you know, you can set up TV monitors and all that stuff so you can cue these things, but all of a sudden this is a lot of work and there's probably an easier way to go. Maybe the, the broadcast mix person, maybe you take stems from the front of house that has already done some of that work for you. Because realistically, your microphone, maybe you'll, you'll EQ that bus a little bit differently. But, um, you know, if you let the front of house person do all the on and off for you and then you receive that bus, now you're just dealing with the overall volume of, of microphones and it, it relieves a lot of that work for the person that's doing the broadcast mix. Completely agree. Um, so broadcast mix engineer in a broadcast mix studio is where it's at, but that's also where the money's at in my experience from building, uh, building rooms and systems and also ripping them out. <laughs> there's the whole spectrum and there's some engineers doing just some, fantastic work and it doesn't get any better than that and on the other hand there's some of us that are trying to become uh studio mix engineers overnight and um <clears throat> there is the there is uh 
a really good engineer can feel and sense through the walls what's happening in the room. They actually can pick up cues from the ambient mics and the noise floor. Um, it's just, it's, it's tricky to do and it's usually an expensive staffed position to do it consistently. But there's, it just doesn't get any better that when you have all that. If you don't, then uh, to lean into the front of house engineer who is, is, like you said, who's already making the critical decisions. And what's interesting is like one of the critical decisions about, well, first going to streaming is to hopefully do less muting and unmuting. And now you're managing that with fader moves so that your noise floor around opening and closing mics blends better with the noise floor of the ambi mics instead of the noise floor popping in and out with mutes. Um, but if the front of, front of house engineer is blending all those choices, is nailing the mic cues, and as importantly, closing mics when they have to be closed, and there's, they better not be open anywhere else on the planet at that moment. Going in for an embrace, whispering something off mic for a second, all those things are really hard to catch through a multi-view monitor and multiple camera shots. Yep. Um, so I do value that, getting stems from the front of house to, to uh, capitalize on those very important decisions uh, where the most of the pressure is right there in the room where they have to be right. So um, let's flip to the streaming platforms for a little bit. So when Chris was on uh, another podcast, one of his coworkers had some interesting stats. When people are watching your stuff on Facebook, he said, usually people spend about five minutes, you know, watching a Facebook stream and then they move on. Uh, unless it's something that they're targeting, right? So the Facebook stream is a good way to, to remind people that you're doing something. It's a great way to get a short message out. Um, but then you also get into, you know, should I do it by YouTube? Should I do a Vimeo? Should I do all these different streaming platforms? Um, and some of those will have longer viewing points, right? So make it a destination where people are going, social media is there trying to get you to watch ads. They're not trying to get you to focus on whatever content you want to watch. One of the things that some churches started running into is they would stream to Facebook and then Facebook would pull them down because they were playing copywritten music. So how do we go about tackling this, this side of it? That's a great question. And I'm sure everybody's running into that now, especially as more and more churches are, are trying to frantically scramble and uh, uh, put something uh, online streaming. Uh, I think it's probably good at this point to go back to the original intent of the streaming license with CCLI. Uh, back in 2011, when we realized that more and more churches, even at that point, were starting to stream, and we realized that the permissions would be a necessary aspect of that, um, we really designed the streaming license at CCLI primarily for the church's own website. Now, we also at that point made provision for other platforms that we knew the churches would certainly use, uh, like YouTube, Vimeo, Facebook, et cetera. And, and what we found in the ensuing years, and especially as people have begun to stream, um, and, and you mentioned it, so let me just start there. Facebook is especially sensitive for copyrighted material and, and <laughs> certainly notorious for pulling things down once their algorithms detect something that's copyrighted. Um, for, first, let me, uh, let me establish that yes, the CCLI streaming license does give you the permission to stream on other platforms, including Facebook. But I think what's important to realize that uh, all of us here in the, in the worship music sector we need to realize that that's a drop in Facebook's ocean of content, you know? I mean, we're a, we are a very small portion of what they deal with. So their whole algorithms for copyrighted music, they're going to flag something and they're just going to immediately take it down. As churches um, face that situation, um, and I've heard from a lot of them and seen a lot of this kind of discussion in the uh, worship leader Facebook groups and things. What will certainly help is um, to indicate your streaming license number uh, somewhere on your broadcast, maybe even along the bottom that it's just there all the time. That may help. Um, once, once the issue arises and you're taken down, um, the discussion that I've heard is that when churches then contact Facebook 
they are able to and and assure Facebook that they yes they do have the permission they have our streaming license that usually works uh, the other thing uh, to keep in mind and I think it's really kind of a hot button for this is if churches are streaming a um, like before the service if they're just simply playing recorded music that's going to flag Facebook immediately all right mm. um, in, in certain live situations, if your version of a particular song is different enough from an original recording, you may skate by without Facebook flagging you. But the closer you get to an original recording, the more likely you are that maybe they, um, they, they will flag you. Uh, so, so that's kind of one of the aspects of Facebook for sure. Um, yes, with the streaming license, that gives you the permission but as I said, Facebook itself may not realize that given that we are such a small part of what they do. Does that help? Yeah. Yes. Now, actually, you mentioned one thing. I don't know if you have the answer to it, but if Facebook takes your stuff down, I know it's contact Facebook, but I mean, who would you contact at the, you know, Facebook? <laughs> yeah. From, from what I've heard is just Mark kind of Zuckerberg. going through their customer support and um, okay. yeah, doing, doing that whole thing. I mean, that's really what it takes. I don't know that there's uh, a way to really proactively protect yourself other than what I mentioned. One, um, it, it's a good idea to go ahead and document your number there at the bottom of your screen. That certainly might help. Um, <laughs> another thing might be, um, uh, maybe you don't do a version of a worship song exactly like the recording that might help as well. So we have some people using multi-tracks which are from the original recordings sometimes. Well, that, that's going to sound so close to the recording. Yeah. Perfect segue, Doug. And that, that really brings up an element that has, you know, if there's a silver lining to this whole pandemic thing, it really kind of is that because prior to just, oh, the last month or two, that was a real issue and a real dilemma with churches who wanted to stream. Because the reality is the streaming license at CCLI and, and really any streaming license covers your church's live version of a song. Mm -hmm. um, a streaming license doesn't give you the permission to rebroadcast another recording, which if you think about it, that's what the tracks and stems are, the multi-tracks, the you know, loop communities, all that. Right. Yeah. The nice thing that happened is that with this pandemic and with the rise in everyone streaming, Multitracks was able to go to the publishers and also Loop Community now and say, look, we, we've had this issue for quite a while. Let's fix this. And they were able uh, to go ahead and secure the permissions from the publishers so that worship bands can now include the stems legally in their broadcasts. Wow. Now, as you say, Doug, that might flag Facebook um, a little more often, but at least now that one particular issue was, was solved that had been a real dilemma up until now. Wow, that's great. Yeah, so you're legally covered, but your live stream might come down. People would have to catch you on the recording later on. Yes, and, and you just have to let them know about it. <laughs> From what I have heard from the churches out there that have gone through this process, um, the customer service dialogue and discussion with Facebook usually yields a good result. So yeah, there's hope. So now the people on Facebook say, well, that sounds amazingly like a Hillsong song, but the singer is nothing like the singer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you guys have comments about what platforms uh, are out there that people could be using because obviously Facebook is something we like to put out there because we figure a lot of our a lot of people would have an account and they might be able to discover our church that way there but uh, are there other platforms that you've had good luck with or you know somebody that's had good luck with the other big platform of course is YouTube and, and right. YouTube the the issues are a little different um, I mean think about all of the millions of cover songs that are on YouTube you know, and they're, yeah. they're there. And sometimes YouTube will take them down. But in, in the world of YouTube, the issue more along, more along that line is really advertising. Um, 
if YouTube, uh, as you upload a video to YouTube, they'll ask you, is this your own material? Or in other words, do you own the copyright? Um, yeah. As you say no, then, uh, then YouTube will either um, allow you to put it up there along with their advertising or they'll just kick you out at that point. So with YouTube, yeah, there's, there's lots of versions of cover songs out there. And the reason that they're able to stay up um, due to copyright restrictions is because the, they're allowing the ad revenue to flow to the rightful owner. If you have something with CCLI so that you can, you know, obviously you don't own the rights, but you, you've basically licensed it. So when you're streaming, you still say, no, I don't have the rights to this music? You, you're saying that I don't own the copyright. In other words, I didn't create Oh, it. okay, okay. Because you don't own it, you're, you're saying I've yes. paid my dues over here right. so that I'm authorized to, re to use this content. And that's, and that's probably a good distinction to clarify with the listeners. You know, yeah. As you're uploading things to YouTube, um, even though you have our license, no, you don't own the copyright to it. A, a publisher or a songwriter owns that portion of it and it's just ccli's relationship with those publishers and songwriters that allows you the right to do what you're doing got it interesting chris uh you know i, I was having a conversation with you and and uh i think churches went from doing their full congregation they were capturing a live performance all of a sudden then they went down and they're really capturing just the pastor's uh, message. Some people aren't filming it in the same place anymore, right? They're doing it somewhere else. Um, you mentioned a company that allows you to post something and then play it live at a particular time. And I, I couldn't remember the name of the company that did that. So basically, it, like at Easter, a lot of, lot of organizations did this. Since it was a stream, they wouldn't really know if you did it live or if you did it the day before. You know, is it live or is it Memorex? Uh, <laughs> But do you remember what the name of the company was that uh, that allowed you to schedule a stream to be played live for you at some point? Forgive me, I'm not remembering the specific company we were talking about. Uh, uh, that's yeah, it's generally it's describing the virtual live offering from yeah. um, like uh, High Vision or um, right, you larger streaming companies. The, if some of the people that are watching, if, if you've used one, maybe you could put it in the... Uh, in the comments, we'll, we'll see if we can pull that up in the, in the chat window. Great, yeah, they're popping up here. Um, so I th yeah, I don't remember the specific one we're talking about, but uh, Virtual Live is pushing the file up instead of streaming it to the cloud, and then the file waits in the cloud until it's <clears throat> released to be streamed as if it was live with the, uh, with the schedule and the support, uh, and you can, the options to support around the website, even with a host a live host, but a tape delayed version of the virtual live rebroadcast from the cloud. I was just going to say, yeah, tape delay would have been the broadcast term for it. <laughs> <laughs> I still respect the tape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we Which did does blur the lines. Really Paul, amazing. that was great. What you said, uh, that alone blurs the lines, uh, like literal tape delay or just the, um, 10 second, uh, beep box to, you know, to blurb out a, unfortunate word or something, um, is that technically live still? So now live is closed, is closed to the gap to are you just delaying for control and processing? Are you just delaying for latency so you can sweeten some things? Are you delaying to reschedule it and advertise it that way? Um, yeah. And late, latency and buffering is so low now that it used to be hours to push a file up and now we're, we can run an echo of it five seconds later for the East Coast. So I, and there's some questions in the chat box here too about when is it not live anymore? I mean, on our monitors, it looks live, but how much longer after the human being qualifies now that the gap just keeps closing. I think that's, I'm confused by it, but it's interesting. Hey, Paul, so one of the things that, that I was thinking of too, so you were mentioning like at the bottom of your screen, you would put, you know, copyright or I have the rights or, you know, whatever your message is down there. There's gotta be some guidelines on at least how big it has to be. And is it, is it just, uh, it has to be legible? At least some number of pixels high and at least some, you know, I don't know, what, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, that question is usually asked in relation to our, uh, to the standard CCLI license. 
Um, yeah. You know, as you're sitting there in church and you see the lyric projections on the screen, um, part of the requirements of the license is that uh, a church also includes the copyright information. Uh, people ask us all the time, um, what, what's the requirement and, and, and all of that? We, we just simply said it needed to be legible. So there's, there's no real hard and fast rule there. Um, then as it applied to the streaming license, there really wasn't any, and I don't know, I don't believe there's really any stipulation on the requirement to do it on your stream. I'm just saying for Facebook purposes, it might be a good idea to let them know that you do have our li the, the CCLI license and that you're documented that way. What I've seen people do is they, it seems like they put it they put like a little subtitle thing there at the end of the at the end of the song, and then maybe they also do it at the end of the whole thing. They just kind of summarize it all there. Right. This seems to be kind of a common practice there. Uh, yes. Paul, I'm yeah. reading. I'm reading a question here from a person in the UK. Is the new CCL license says that streaming or the recorded stream must be done from the church, as all our UK churches are closed. We cannot do this as a collective worship band. Therefore, can a multi-track recording be made by musicians in a dispersed location that could be a church hall or more likely their own home? It's a great question, especially for right now. You know, I mean, obviously the world has gone sideways here. Um, and, the, uh, and the rules were written um, in a different time, certainly. Uh, I can't really speak for CCLI yeah. anymore. But I think it's a great question to raise with them, especially now considering the limitations we all have. Right. Um, and, and the CCLI support staff is really responsive to those kinds of questions. You'll get an immediate answer. And, and the other thing is, if you raise an issue that's a particular, uh, of particular importance, especially right now, given the situation, um, the CCLI support team has the ability to then go to publishers, perhaps, and um, and hopefully make arrangements to um, allow things that, um, that that may help during this whole time. Right. Yeah, you know, because that's a good thing. Yeah, because a lot of times they they might have called that license a site license, right? Yes. So, I, and then under normal under normal circumstances, I think you can see the the wisdom of that. Um, yeah. These days, though, it's 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 certainly different. So it's it's worth pursuing the uh, the question and the discussion. I thought of a question while we're scanning that. Yeah. Uh, for Paul, um, I guess it was the description of ten people in ten living rooms creating a deliverable. <laughs> so we're going to record that somewhere. Technically. If we upload that back to a computer at the license site and press play into the encoder, is the transmission from the church. <laughs> <laughs> and this is exactly what happens with technology and copyright. <laughs> Happened ever since the dawn of copyright. I, I yeah. used to do copyright sessions, you know, in the worship conferences that Doug and I were part of. And I always made the point that technology always races forward and copyright always is, always lags, you know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's copyright that has the latency, believe me, you know? <laughs> always trying to catch up. You know, in this, in this case, it's hard to tell. I mean, you know, we see these composite videos that are made by these amazing choirs of all different places, you know, and, and that's the thing now. Um, I think the copyright rules are clearly behind those times and were written before those times. So it's a great yeah. question. I, I can't answer it, but that's the dynamics that we're dealing with. I mean, we all know how fast technology moves. Um, copyright law takes an act of Congress, literally. And we also know how fast that moves. Yeah. Um, that might be intentional yeah. delay. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Paul. One of the questions from Eric Bishop, so getting back to the, you know, dealing with the live event where we have uh, music at one level, speech at another. So how do you bring these two together? You don't want to just smash everything into a compressor and let it do its thing. If you can actually remix it, that would be a preferable thing. Chris, you actually had uh, ideas about double busing or 
recombining buses in different ways, and that might be a good conversation to have. Okay. Um, I'll jump to the matrix, I think, as an example, since some consoles handle double busing and some don't because of internal timing issues or plugins or routing paths. So if the console, most digital consoles have a little bit of a matrix, some of them behave in different ways, but um, the idea is to take all your music and maybe you send it to your left and right bus. That's fine if that's um, used to, you're used to that drive in the PA. Let's say, let's feed that stereo bus into the matrix and let the matrix drive the PA. So now we've just introduced one more place where you can process or EQ or manage or whatever. So we have our, all of our music, vocals, tracks, everything, going to our stereo bus and instead of the stereo bus feeding the PA, it's now feeding a matrix and the matrix is feeding the PA. Mm -hmm. um, so the next level would be to take all of our speech channels and instead of putting them in the stereo bus, put them into a new bus called speech or whatever. And then in the matrix, that speech bus feeds the PA also. So now your music and your speech, nothing has changed from the front of house or how the PA sounds except for um, that in your speech mics, you're piping into the new speech bus instead of the music bus. So that all remains unchanged. But now that you have those available in the matrix, in addition to the PA coming out of the matrix, you can have broadcast coming out of the matrix. And right there at that cross point where your music and speech are feeding PA and broadcast, you can take the speech to broadcast and gas it up. 6 dB, 10 dB is not uncommon relative to the um, music to broadcast intersection. So right there in the music, you're getting 10 dB of boost of speech relative to music in broadcast only without changing anything about the way you mix or about the way it sounds. And then that closes that gap downstream for um, more reasonable processing instead of having to be so dramatic with it. And, and the only difference there was you're assigning a speech to a speech bus instead of dumping it in with everything else. And that alone and adding some ambi mics that are not being compressed with everything else, those two things just wake up the room and close the gap. In my opinion, those are two of the first things I would go for and are generally free things, you know, free of charge uh, if you have those available buses to work with. So if you, yeah, if you ever want to understand what a, what a matrix is, as Chris was saying, you basically got all your channels, you're mixing it to a bus, right? And you're, you're putting one in one bus, one in another. And then the, the matrix just lets you take those buses and mix them in different amounts. Mm -hmm. So a matrix is mixing mixes, basically. Yeah. Right on. <laughs> And, and once you have them available, it's easy to add some of those other free things that might be sitting right there in your console, a little gentle multi-band compression on the music yeah. and a, a more aggressive one, ideally towards leveling, but maybe more aggressive compression and limiting on speech, close that gap. And since those two are separate, they're sitting in their own relative pockets. They're not fighting for the same target. And the ambi bed is sitting there underneath it all unchanged, just like the room is unchanged with what's happening in the room. So Mixing mixes, exactly. Yeah. And so if, if you think about it that way, if your mixer doesn't have a matrix capability, one thing you can do is just say, okay, I'm just going to take the buses out of my console and I'll feed it to another mixer. And it doesn't even have to be a fancy one. It could, you know, you could just say, hey, I'm just going to take, you know, 12 channels of buses out of here and I'm going to feed it to an analog mixer I have here and make it happen that way. I mean, obviously, if it's all on the, if it's all on your, network then it's just an easy you know click and you you've made your route but um like i said if you're having to deal with what you have on hand at the time um yeah you could do that with an analog thing and and get it in there right at least so you can start experimenting with it and of course at that point that's when your your streaming mix could also pull in other things like the ambient mics and things like that that aren't part of your front of house you add that back in and then you can take it as far as you want when you're putting together these streaming mixes, the question is how far do you want to go with it? If you're doing it in the console, manage your expectations on how much you're going to get done, right? So if I'm, everything is straight off the front of house console and I'm just going to come out with another stereo pair that goes to my streaming mix, you know, I'm going to take myself to a level. If I try to go too far with that, uh, boy, what a tangled web I've put inside the, the mixer, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> 
uh, you'll be throwing cans on every five seconds or having a friend reach over for knobs and all that. Yeah, it gets busy real quick. Um, it is a lot to swallow and by breaking them up into some manageable groups, it becomes easier to manage in my opinion. Um, if I could throw in one question, Larry Frisk just asked and he, and he's just talking about that web you weave, this can of worms. He asked a great question that reveals kind of the next level of how you manage this. Um, you have a worship leader that's singing at full tilt and then um, talks at 10 to 15 dB quieter. Um, so if that's mm. if that's working in the room, that's great. But to, but to close that gap, so you're still within the music uh, bus. Sure. Um, but it is a vocalist with that much dynamic range, and uh, so you just even within that, you don't want to squeeze that squeeze the life out of that. Um, and in outboard processing, that's where I still do a little bit of leveling on the entire music bus. So if somebody's talking through a vocal mic, which is in the music bus to gently give it a three, four, five dB lift during those moments without bringing up Ambi, without sounding like he's coming out of a squeezed compressor. Uh, but those are the kinds of things to keep it alive, but to still close the gap without squeezing it. Um, that can happen once you're outboard of the console. Um, some great Waves plugins, some of our favorite great outboard analog gear, uh, but there's ways to handle a group in different ways. What happens when it's really loud? What happens when it's really quiet? And I appreciate that question because one of the greatest challenges that, that out of commissioning a whole system, I'll spend hours on this one, when the worship leader's cranking vocals and then is talking and then a pastor on a head mic comes up and talks to him for a second. That is the moment. When you're when Ambi is responsive, the room's responding, and you have a vocal on the downside of processing in the music bus, and you have a head mic on the high end of gain coming out of a responded crowd. If you can get those two talking to each other and processing from different buses, that's one of the top sweet spots. And that's the fun that a broadcast engineer has has when they're nailing it down in the studio. But if you can do that on an automated level too, I think that's that's one of the funnest targets to to hit. So, you know, Mr. Hatmaker, he was doing a show and he, he said, uh, you know, one of the things that he tries to do, like you said, somebody's got the headset mic, somebody has a lavalier, somebody else has the handheld and they sound nothing alike. The lavalier sounded fine until you heard the handheld. He's like, so long as I make the handheld sound like the other one, everything sounds fine. You're moving on. Sometimes he said, I sacrifice the best, best, best sound possible for a more consistent experience. And that was his uh, bit of advice on that. I completely agree. And isn't it a painful shame to have to carve out some of that great, rich, low end? But yeah. if you want them in the same room, having the same experience, and you want to hear the conversation instead of, wow, that sounds different, I have to completely agree. And uh, there are some ways to uh, use an expander with a high threshold so the vocal isn't waking up that yeah. rich low end until they're leaning into it a little bit. Right. Uh, but I would have to agree instead of making each individual thing sound amazing, how they relate together in those moments is important. Yeah. Sometimes it's not a technical thing either. Like in a small church, you just, I had a worship leader who was just very timid when he spoke, sure. but he didn't yeah. mind belting it when he sang. So it's just a matter of recording him, the difference between how he talks and how he sings. And I said, just lean into a little bit more when you're speaking and don't be so afraid because people can't hear you. Don't you want them to hear what you have to say? And leveraging uh, the proximity effect yeah. with their awareness, right? They can, they can help you do that. Yeah, that's good, Doug. So one of the other things you can do on that, um, and I've seen this done before, they'll take the same person's mic, put it on two channel strips next to each other. Yeah. One tuned when he's singing with the band, one when he's talking with the pastor. Yeah. And all you do is your fingers just go down and mute one and unmute the other at the same time. Take the reverb off too when he's speaking. <laughs> well, that, and with, by muting the channel, that would happen naturally too. Yeah. But that, that's definitely true. If you only have one channel strip, absolutely. Uh. Uh, but the, the other thing I was going to say too, you were mentioning, um, you know, what do you do if you have these two different, very different volumes? Um, the other story I'll tell, you know, you, especially if you don't have plugins and things like that. And I, I love a good plugin, but I think sometimes people overuse them. They over rely on them. 
Chris Taylor was working with a big name country artist and uh, he'd helped, you know, prep a show. And then it went on tour and they said, yeah, I don't know what happened. You know, all of a sudden the lead singer, the star's voice just, it just shrunk and they couldn't figure it out. And the guy was like, well, I've got, you know, this plugin to manage this and this plugin to manage that. And so they pulled Chris in and they said, so, you know, what, what did you do? And, and Chris just looked at it and said, well, I didn't have any plugins. I just had my finger on the fader. <laughs> And then if, if she sang too loud, I pulled it down. And if she sang too quiet, I pulled it up. So, so that still works? That still works. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to be automatic. And by the way, I think, you know, compressors and all that stuff, there's no way you can, especially when your mix gets to be, you know, 30, 60, 100 channels, my goodness. But um, usually you'll, you'll pick a few of those things that are going to try to sit out front the things that people are really focusing on. And maybe those are the ones I'm going to try to put more manual control on. So I get what I want out of it. Um, I mean, I'll still have dynamics on those because you certainly want to be able to automatically capture things and keep them in a range. And maybe you're putting expanders to cut down background noise, but just the overall volume. Yeah. Just keeping your finger on the fader, especially for primary sources like the worship leader, the pastor, those, those channels will sit up there. Now there's consoles that have uh, custom layers. And what I see people do is those channels will always sit on the same place in every custom layer that you go to. They never disappear. So there's something to be said for manual control. But when we, when we come to automating the system, Chris, I don't know if you want to spend a little bit of time talking about how, I, oh, I never told the story about Oprah, but do you want to, Spend a little bit of time talking about your Oprah system and we'll. <laughs> Am I allowed to that? say the word Oprah? I guess there's nothing flagging us on here. Uh, <laughs> so 15 plus uh, years ago, I was hurled into developing a system which started some of this automated balancing system from, from uh, groups from the front of house. At the same time, I was building a broadcast recording studio. So I was able to compare everything plus have the insurance of multiple approaches before we figured out how to do satellite uplink broadcast. Um, so we felt like we were close. I'm learning the whole process out of necessity. Um, downtown Chicago, the uplink facility, I'm driving to switches, learning how satellites talk at 17,500 miles and uh, the, ter the, latency, <laughs> the latency of that chain. Eighth of a second to outer space, eighth of a second back, twice, two hops, that whole thing. It was just incredible. Um, so I f we finally got it dialed in, and I've got this collection of gear that seems to be leveling things pretty well. We're hitting our minus three, minus four on our meter. So I call the uplink facility and say, how are we looking? Tomorrow we go live for this global broadcast. And they say, hold on a second. And they look over to the side, and they get back on the phone and say, don't touch a thing. You're coming in better than Oprah. So from that moment on, I nicknamed this collection of gear and this approach of taking groups and processing them and trying to have the tension and the tug of war of them ducking and pulling on each other so it keeps moving while you have this ambi ambient bed underneath it all. Uh, that's been called Oprah for approaching 20 years. And there's a one in Germany called Oprah Hausen, just made that up. And we're up to Oprah version three now. It's using a lot of Waves plugins, but... Uh, that's Oprah in a nutshell. It was just one of those phone calls where you're like, oh good, all this work sounds like it paid off and hey, maybe we're gonna be kind of professional tomorrow. Let's do this thing. So thanks for asking. Yeah, but uh, like you said, you, were, you, you put together a system where you were taking the buses off the console and everything we, we talked about, you know, bringing the ambient mics, you're doing this, you're bringing things up and down. Um, do you wanna talk a little bit about how it's structured or? or sure. Um, at the simplest level, uh, I think it's a strong start and it can go a really long way to just break the music from speech and then have ambi separate. So that's five channels if speech is mono um, or in, on three buses, two stereo buses and a mono bus. So to bring those in um, and then manage them separately, give them whether you're really playing them against each other or not, just to have a different set of multiband EQ multiband compression, a limiter, get them all up in the meter where you want them. Uh, that's a really strong start. Um, beyond that, I would look at ducking the ambi by the pre-processed 
music bus before processing. Um, so that's a way of saying if music is at, starts to approach 90 dBA slow in the room, that the ambient mics are not picking up any much more usable congregational singing. That's as loud as they get relative to the PA and now it's just becoming a roar. Uh, so you can pick a threshold there where once you're that and beyond, you actually pull down ambient a little bit and it dries things up imperceivably just a little bit, improves clarity, improves uh, depth, uh, width, stereo field width, um, but then when they drop down to the breakdown, it's already filled back in and perceivably and you hear the person in the corner, you know, the baby in the corner or whatever you want, however much you want there. Uh, so that'd be like the next level is just a little bit of balancing where cranking music can pull Ambi back just a touch, get those two dancing together. Um, and then beyond that, I would bring in play out separately because when you press play on a pre-produced video, it just blares everything because it's loudness is so high. Uh, so you can't throw it into the speech bus because it's going to be aggressively leveled. You can't throw it into the music bus because it's just going to still be in your face. If you can throw it in a new bus, give it its own little set, have it dry ambi up e even more. Because when you're pressing play on a video, do you want it to sound like people are watching a video in a room? Or do you want it to be a video to the world? Uh, so then you can balance that. Um, beyond that is breaking vocals out and then playing with that. So if vocals are a little buried in the mix in the room, you can give them a 2 dB bump and broadcast. Um, that would kind of be the range, I would say, from three buses to six and from five channels worth to about 10. And then some side chaining where they're starting to play with each other. And then from there, it's all art. <laughs> and and beyond there, get a broadcast engineer. <laughs> Chris gave a great explanation of a matrix, which are used in so many different applications. Now, a lot of people are actually using matrices for their in-ear mixes, as opposed to just front fills or under balcony fills or the foyer mix or the cry room or whatever. But the more matrices you have, <laughs> boy, it's a lot of cool stuff you can do with them. Yeah, and if, if it's not huge on the console to pipe at least those stems into another Yamaha processor or something where you yeah. handle it out there. Then if your console blows up, you change your console, your facility is still intact. But right. have a matrix somewhere in the chain is very powerful. Yeah, yeah that, that was, and I thought that was a great point when you brought it up. You know, even if you could do it all in the console, just uh, too many hands trying to get at the same surface, you know. They got enough pressure on themselves already. They don't need to try to make uh, a couple of perfect mixes at the same time, you know? Unless you're monitors. <laughs> Unless you're monitors, at which point everybody kind of knows, like, well, you're going to get me in the ballpark. It's, you know, <laughs> I can make some adjustments. Um, some people had some questions about uh, having people play together in different locations. Uh, can Dante do that? Uh, we can, but you might not be thinking about it in the right way. I'll just say, if you're thinking about doing Dante over the internet, that's, that's a no-no. Uh, if you have fiber between locations, so if you have multiple uh, church properties and they're linked by fiber, then we can do it. Uh, if you have an interest in that, we have another webinar called Dante Over Distance. And uh, it, this is actually a university uh, application where they've linked multiple campuses. Uh, but I'm sure you could understand it as linking uh, multiple church campuses as well. So I would check that one out. Um, but, uh, okay, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. All our, all our attendees, our, our panelists uh, covered a lot of different things. I think this was uh, – I enjoyed this one. <laughs> okay. So thank, uh, Chris and Doug and Paul. All right, well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Have a great day. Thanks, and, Paul. Uh, Thank you, Chris. Right Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Paul. Thank, Thank you, guys. Absolute great. pleasure. Thank you, Patrick. All right. Take care.